You have heard John D. Rockefeller abused considerably, but most of this abuse has been prompted by sheer envy upon the part of those who would like to have his money, but who haven't the inclination to earn it. Regardless of your opinion of Rockefeller, do not forget that he began as a humble bookkeeper and that he gradually climbed to the top in the accumulation of money because of his ability to organize and direct other and less able men intelligently. This author can remember when he had to pay twenty-five cents for a gallon of lamp oil and walk two miles through the hot sun and carry it home in a tin can in the bargain. Now, Rockefeller's wagon will deliver it at the back door, in the city or on the farm, at a little over half that sum. Who has a right to begrudge Rockefeller his millions, as long as he has reduced the price of a needed commodity? He could just as easily have increased the price of lamp oil to half a dollar. But we seriously doubt that he would be a multimillionaire today if he had done so. There are a lot of us who want money, but ninety-nine out of every hundred who start to create a plan through which to get money give all their thought to the scheme through which to get hold of it, and no thought to the service to be given in return for it. A pleasing personality is one that makes use of imagination and cooperation. We have cited the foregoing illustrations of how ideas may be created to show you how to coordinate the laws of imagination, cooperation, and a pleasing personality. Analyze any man who does not have a pleasing personality, and you will find lacking in that man the faculties of imagination and cooperation also. This brings us to a suitable place at which to introduce one of the greatest lessons on personality ever placed on paper. It is also one of the most effective lessons on salesmanship ever written, for the subjects of attractive personality and salesmanship must always go hand in hand. They are inseparable. I have reference to Shakespeare's masterpiece, Mark Antony's speech at the funeral of Caesar. Perhaps you have read this oration, but it is here presented with interpretations in parentheses which may help you to gather a new meaning from it. The setting for that oration was something like the following. Caesar is dead, and Brutus, his slayer, is called on to tell the Roman mob that is gathered at the undertakers why he put Caesar out of the way. Picture in your imagination a howling mob that was none too friendly to Caesar, and that already believed that Brutus had done a noble deed by murdering him. Brutus takes the platform and makes a short statement of his reasons for killing Caesar. Confident that he has won the day, he takes his seat. His whole demeanor is that of one who believes his word will be accepted without question. It is one of haughtiness. Mark Antony now takes the platform, knowing that the mob is antagonistic to him because he is a friend of Caesar. In a low, humble tone of voice, Antony begins to speak. Antony. For Brutus's sake I am beholding to you. Fourth citizen. What does he say of Brutus? Third citizen. He says for Brutus's sake he finds himself beholding to us all. Fourth citizen. T'were best he speak no harm of Brutus here. First citizen. This Caesar was a tyrant. Third citizen. Nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Second citizen. Peace. Let us hear what Antony can say. Here you will observe in Antony's opening sentence his clever method of neutralizing the minds of his listeners. Antony. You gentle Romans, about as gentle as a gang of Bolsheviks in a revolutionary labor meeting. All. Peace, ho, let us hear him. Had Antony begun his speech by knocking Brutus, the history of Rome would have been different. Antony. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Allying himself with what he knew to be the state of mind of his listeners. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man, he hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept, Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. 
You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and surely he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but I am here to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment! Thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. At this point, Antony paused to give his audience a chance to discuss hurriedly among themselves his opening statements. His object in doing this was to observe what effect his words were having, just as a master salesman always encourages his prospective purchaser to talk so he may know what is in his mind. First Citizen Methinks there is much in his sayings. Second Citizen If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Third Citizen Has he masters? I fear there will be worse come in his place. Fourth Citizen Mark ye his words? He would not take the crown? Therefore tis certain he was not ambitious. First Citizen If it be found so, someone will dear abide it. Second Citizen Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. Third Citizen There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Fourth Citizen Now mark him, he begins again to speak. Antony But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he here and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, appealing to their vanity, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who, you all know, are honorable men. Observe how often Antony has repeated the term honorable. Observe also how cleverly he brings in the first suggestion that Perhaps Brutus and Cassius may not be as honorable as the Roman mob believes them to be. This suggestion is carried in the words mutiny and rage, which he here uses for the first time, after his pause gave him time to observe that the mob was swinging over toward his side of the argument. Observe how carefully he is feeling his way and making his words fit that which he knows to be the frame of mind of his listeners. Antony I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. Crystallizing his suggestion into hatred of Brutus and Cassius, he then appeals to their curiosity and begins to lay the foundation for his climax, a climax which he knows will win the mob because he is reaching it so cleverly that the mob believes it to be its own conclusion. Antony but here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. Tightening up on his appeal to their curiosity, by making them believe he does not intend to read the will. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, and dip their napkins in his sacred blood, yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and, dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. Human nature always wants that which is difficult to get, or that of which it is about to be deprived. Observe how craftily Antony has awakened the interest of the mob and made them want to hear the reading of the will, thereby preparing them to hear it with open minds. This marks his second step in the process of neutralizing their minds. All. The will, the will, we will hear Caesar's will. Antony. Have patience, gentle friends, I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men, and being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. Exactly what he wishes to do. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what will come of it? Fourth Citizen. Read the will, we'll hear it. You shall read us the will, Caesar's will. Antony, will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. Daggers and stabbed suggest cruel murder. Observe how cleverly Antony injects this suggestion into his speech. And observe also how quickly the mob catches its significance. 
Because unknown to the mob, Antony has carefully prepared their minds to receive this suggestion. Fourth Citizen They were traitors, honorable men. All. The will, the testament. Second Citizen They were villains, murderers. The will. Just what Antony would have said in the beginning, but he knew it would have a more desirable effect if he planted the thought in the minds of the mob and permitted them to say it themselves. Antony You will compel me then to read the will? Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend, and will you give me leave? This was the point at which Brutus should have begun to look for a back door through which to make his escape. All. Come down, second citizen. Descend, third citizen. Room for Antony, most noble Antony. Antony. Nay, press not so upon me. Stand far off. He knew this command would make them want to draw nearer, which is what he wanted them to do. All. Stand back. Room. Antony. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. T'was on a summer's evening, in his tent, that day he overcame the nervi eye. Look, in this place ran Cassius's dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him. Then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen! Then I and you and all of us fell down while bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind soul, why weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself marred, as you see, with traitors. Observe how Antony now uses the word traitors quite freely, because he knows that it is in harmony with that which is in the minds of the Roman mob. First citizen. O piteous spectacle. Second citizen. O woeful day. Third citizen. O woeful day. First citizen. Almost bloody sight, second citizen. We will be revenged. Had Brutus been a wise man instead of a braggart, he would have been many miles from the scene by this time. All revenge, about, seek, burn, fire, kill, slay. Let not a traitor live. Here Antony takes the next step toward crystallizing the frenzy of the mob into action. But clever salesman that he is does not try to force this action. Antony. Stay, countrymen. First citizen. Peace there. Hear the noble Antony. Second citizen. We'll hear him. We'll follow him. We'll die with him. From these words, Antony knows that he has the mob with him. Observe how he takes advantage of this psychological moment, the moment for which all master salesmen wait. Antony. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They were wise and honorable, and will, no doubt, with reasons, answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither wit nor words nor worth, action nor utterance nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that would move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. All. We'll mutiny, first citizen. We'll burn the house of Brutus, third citizen. Away, then, come, seek the conspirators. Antony, yet hear me, countrymen, yet hear me speak. All, peace, ho, hear Antony, most noble Antony. Antony, 
Why, friends, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your love? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then. You have forgot the will I told you of. Antony is now ready to play his trump card. He is ready to reach his climax. Observe how well he has marshaled his suggestions, step by step, saving until the last his most important statement, the one on which he relied for action. In the great field of salesmanship and in public speaking, many a man tries to reach this point too soon, tries to rush his audience or his prospective purchaser, and thereby loses his appeal. All. Most true, the will. Let's stay and hear the will. Antony. Here is the will, and under Caesar's seal. To every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, seventy-five drachmas. Second citizen. Most noble Caesar will revenge his death. Third citizen. O oh, royal Caesar. Antony. Hear me with patience. All. Peace, ho. Antony. Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors, and his new planted orchards, on this side Tiber. He hath left them you, and to your heirs forever, common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourself. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? First citizen. Never, never, come away. We'll burn his body in the holy place, and with the brands fire the traitor's houses. Take up the body. Second citizen. Go fetch fire. Third citizen. Pluck down benches. Fourth citizen. Pluck down forms, windows, anything. And that was Brutus's finish. He lost his case because he lacked the personality and the good judgment with which to present his argument from the viewpoint of the Roman mob, as Mark Antony did. His whole attitude clearly indicated that he thought pretty well of himself, that he was proud of his deed. We have all seen people in this day and time who somewhat resemble Brutus in this respect, but if we observe closely we notice that they do not accomplish very much. Suppose that Mark Antony had mounted the platform in a strutting attitude and had begun his speech in this wise. Now let me tell you, Roman, something about this man Brutus. He is a murderer at heart, and he would have gone no further, for the mob would have howled him down. Clever salesman and practical psychologist that he was, Mark Antony so presented his case that it appeared not to be his own idea at all, but that of the Roman mob itself. Go back to the lesson on initiative and leadership and read it again. And as you read, compare the psychology of it with that of Mark Antony's speech. Observe how the you and not I attitude toward others was emphasized. Observe, if you please, how this same point is emphasized throughout this course, and especially in Lesson 7 on enthusiasm. Shakespeare was by far the most able psychologist and writer known to civilization. For that reason, all of his writings are based upon unerring knowledge of the human mind. Throughout this speech, which he placed in the mouth of Mark Antony, you will observe how carefully he assumed the you attitude, so carefully that the Roman mob was sure that its decision was of its own making. I must call your attention, however, to the fact that Mark Antony's appeal to the self-interest of the Roman mob was of the crafty type, and was based upon the stealth with which dishonest men often make use of this principle in appealing to the cupidity and avarice of their victims. While Mark Antony displayed evidence of great self-control in being able to assume, at the beginning of his speech, an attitude toward Brutus that was not real, at the same time it is obvious that his entire appeal was based upon his knowledge of how to influence the minds of the Roman mob, through flattery. The two letters reproduced in Lesson 7 of this course illustrate in a very concrete way the value of the you and the fatality of the I appeal. Go back and read these letters again, and observe how the more successful of the two follows closely the Mark Antony appeal, while the other one is based upon an appeal of just the opposite nature. Whether you are writing a sales letter, or preaching a sermon, or writing an advertisement, or a book, you will do well to follow the same principles employed by Mark Antony in his famous speech.